I am Tristan. Angelina. Namaste, Shafiq. Regina. Habari asubuhi, Javi. Jag är en kristen och jag bor i Norge. I live in the United States of America. In Australia. Malaysia. No Brazil. Tunisia, Kenya. My passion is for fashion and design. I love to dance. Minus rutan. Para viajar e descobrir novas culturas. Ana penda kunitazama nikipuliza mapovu. Jag älskar idrott och att spela spel med familjen min. Minhas paixões são minha fuga quando as coisas estão difíceis. Ada hari-harinya apabila melakukan perkara yang biasa akan jadi sangat susah. When your disease makes you feel isolated. It's difficult to walk. O var me på lager. When I'm tired. Afraid. O controle da doença pode ser desafiador. Atau mengecewakan bila saya kehilangan masa. Muda muhimu sana. But we learned to be resilient. Para apreciar os pequenos detalhes que me trazem alegria. Kumuona mtoto wangu wa kiume anavyofurahi tunapoenda nje. Nikijua anasikiza hadithi na sauti zilizo karibu. Mencari titik perhubungan dengan masyarakat yang tak pernah saya sedar wujud. Over övinge på grund av människorna runt mig. Their fear support. Sua bondade inabalável. The big big love. Mina vänner. Kloarga. Infermeiras. Doctors. Support workers. Assistenter. Mashirika ya wagonjwa. Together we are a strong community. Mina weza kuelekewa. Histórias compartilhadas que me libertaram das dúvidas. Oh, calma, salte, let's. I am Tristan. I live with sickle cell. I'm Angelina. And she has CASC, a neurological disorder. Saya Shafiq dan saya hidup dengan ectodermal dysplasia. Regina, eu tinha leiomiosarcoma, um câncer raro. Who you need, Harvey? Ana SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. You and Christian Oyai are ui, me fat pen shirt. Esta é minha vida. Suara saya. And I am more than my disease. We are rare. Camira mãe. Nós somos fortes. And we are proud. org. Uh, so next Welcome. is time to begin coordinating and preparing for your first coalition Salt meeting. President uh, and CEO of the National Organization for your new coalition to encourage oh, the group to share resources, guys. provide to updates, a YouTube and to video. share opportunities with the <laughs> Automatically start playing. I am Tristan. Angelina. Namaste, Shafiq. Regina. Habari asubui, Javi. I would like to welcome you to our 2021 Virtual Rare Disease Day event. But before we begin, I'd like to send out a special thank you to all those advocates and others who have spent so much energy and time supporting the rare disease community. So thank you. The role of Rare Disease Day is to bring together advocates and patients from around the world to help tell the story about rare diseases. There are events like this happening virtually all over this country today. And some of the audiences that we're really trying to focus on are those in the state legislatures, where advocates and legislative people come together to understand the burden of rare diseases and the impacts it can have on them, and therefore build the appropriate legislation and pathway to make sure that bills are passed that support rare disease patients. As a matter of fact, NORD's doing that in a very focused way with rare disease advisory councils. We've got them set up down 16 states and are building them in others. I think 2021 is going to be an interesting year for us. The reason I say that is because we've just come off of a very difficult year with a pandemic that's impacted the rare disease community in a number of different ways and has really shown some of the inequities in the healthcare system. For all of you that are watching today, the importance of the Rare Disease Advisory Councils is critical to the success of being able to communicate the story and the needs of the rare disease patient community. So in conclusion, I would really like to make sure that I recognize and thank all of those sponsors who have helped us make this day a reality. Without your continued support, none of this would happen. So a sincere thank you from all of us at Nord and the patient community. Taking part in events like today's are really important to the rare disease community. And we must always remember that alone we are rare 
and together we are strong. All right, thank you. So thank you for joining us today. We're gonna to start just with a few housekeeping things. Um, so we are recording this event uh, and it's just important to say that NOR does not offer any legal or medical advice. So uh, my name is Krista Gilbert and I am one of the New Hampshire State Ambassadors for the Rare Action Network. Uh, my son and I both have rare disorders and I became involved in advocacy work as a way to give voice to my beliefs about changes that needed to be made in the educational and medical systems based on our experiences. Um, I'm currently on the NORD Policy uh, Steering Committee, uh, the board of the New Hampshire Rare Disorders Association, which is a local nonprofit, uh, the New Hampshire Developmental Disabilities Policy Committee, and the New Hampshire Rare Disease Advisory Council. Um, through my advocacy work, I found purpose and a feeling that I'm working to make real change at the state and federal level. The Rare Action Network is looking for additional volunteers, including leadership positions in our state. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about volunteering, please contact me. I'm excited about our event today as we celebrate the internationally recognized Rare Disease Day. Our agenda today includes an overview of the state report card with NORD's goal of evaluating and communicating how effectively New Hampshire is serving people with rare diseases. We'll continue today's event with caregivers and patients sharing stories about living with a rare disorder. Dr. Plotkin and Senator Rosenwald will share their perspectives on working with and advocating for people living with and caring for those with a rare disorder. We'll also share information about NORD's programs, including the Rare Action Network and their websites. During the final 30 minutes, we will provide some additional local resources and an opportunity for open discussion. It's now my pleasure to introduce Anissa Reed, NORD's Manager of State Policy for the Eastern Region. Region. Great, thank you so much, Krista, and thank you all for joining us today. So I wanna jump into a little overview of what a Rare Disease Advisory Council is. So let's start with the problem. More than 25 million Americans are living with one of the more than 7,000 unique rare diseases. That breaks down to about one in 10 Americans. So even though that may seem like a lot, state decision makers still have limited awareness of the issues and impact that rare diseases have on patients, their caregivers, and the overall healthcare system. So what's the solution? So NORD believes it is to create a Rare Disease Advisory Council, which is a diverse body to advise state government on the common obstacles that the rare disease community faces. So we see this as an enormous opportunity for government officials and the rare disease community to work together to develop resources necessary to prevent and address barriers in a strategic way. Um, so there's a number of different differences between RDACs in states. So for instance, the number of members uh, varied funding sources, um, differences where the council works out of, and um, differences in duties. So overall, each RDAC does have the same goal, which is to support the rare disease community by increasing the voice of rare patients and caregivers at the state level. So to date, we have 16 states that have passed RDAC legislation, uh, including New Hampshire, and we also have several other states who are currently having bills uh, being heard so that they are hopefully gonna be having some additional RDAC signed into law this year. So as mentioned, we're thrilled to have an increase in the number of states with RDACs. Uh, we wanna continue increasing this number to give as many rare disease advocates a voice in state government as possible. NORD is highly encouraging uh, the different RDACs to collaborate with one another to share ideas and best practices. Uh, we plan to continue to develop and release toolkits and one-pagers, host webinars, and convene additional meetings to support ongoing RDAC work. So in 2019, New Hampshire's RDAC bill, House Bill 237, was signed into law. 
Uh, we're happy to report that this is an active council full of strong rare disease advocates in this state. So some duties that the New Hampshire Art Act focuses on is advising the legislature on and Department of Health and Human Services on rare diseases, encouraging public awareness on rare diseases, and coordinating with other states, uh, rare disease advisory bodies, community-based organizations, and other public and private organizations. New Hampshire Art Act meetings are open to the public, which gives the rare disease community in the state uh, an opportunity to consistently provide feedback and the chance to work on advocacy efforts with the council. So if you're interested in learning more about New Hampshire's Art Act, then please reach out to Krista Gilbert um, at krista.gilbert at rareaction.org. So now I'm gonna briefly jump into an overview of an important tool that we use at NORD. In 2015, NORD launched its state report card project with the goal of evaluating how effectively states uh, people are serving with in rare diseases some policy issues. So this year marks the sixth edition of the state report card, which was compiled using data current as of November, 2020. So there are, these are some policy issues that NORD's report card focuses on. Uh, it is important to note, however, that these issues are not exhaustive. These issues touch on several critical and relevant policy areas at the state level. But with each issue included, there are still many others that are capable of impacting the lives of rare disease patients. So how do you find out where your state measures up? So you can select your state by clicking on this link. Um, each state's page is also available in a printable version. So I'm gonna share a short video that uh, walks you through our report card uh, website. So here we have the landing page for the sixth edition of the North State Report Card. We've just got a little intro text up here. And then we have Have the eight issues that we um, assessed in the sixth edition of the report right here. If you go over here, we have um, a drop down bar where you can click and select your state. And then right underneath of that, we have all of these patient stories um, about all of some of the issues that are focused on in the report card. So now I'm just gonna to navigate to one of the issue pages. I'm gonna click Medicaid Financial Eligibility, and that'll take you to this individual issue page. Um, we just got a little bit of intro text again at the top, and then some more text about what the issue really is and why NORD cares about it underneath. Then we have some text about the grading methodology for this section, as well as the rubric, which is available at the bottom, and also underneath of the map right here. Um, again, we have that drop down bar where you can select your state. Then if you go to the left over here, you can click and access all of NORD's policy statements on the particular issue. And then you can also click and access the appendix for that section. Um, so next, I'll look at the map a little bit. So um, you can hover over each state on the map and see the state's overall grade which is bolded there for this section as well as the subgrades that were averaged together to get that overall grade. Um, if you click on any of the states it will take you to that state's individual state report card page. So I clicked on Virginia and here is Virginia's state report card. Um, if you scroll you can see that we have all eight sections and their overall grade up here in orange and then the subgrades underneath um, and you can also click this right here if you want to open a printable version of the individual state report card great So um, these are just small snapshots of some policy issues that impact the rare disease community in 2020. So current legislation and changes that have been made so far in 2021 have not yet been captured. So um, if your state recently passed some legislation to improve one of the policy issues, they might not have um, that grade reflected until the seventh edition where we will review uh, the different state policy issues.
So if you have any questions about our report card, then you can always send us an email uh, at policy at rarediseases.org. So uh, with that, I will turn it back over to Krista. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Tim Geidish is the father of an 11 year old with cystic fibrosis. Uh, he is the father, of, uh, sorry, he is the board member. He is a board member of the Northern New England chapter of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and an executive committee member of the New Hampshire Council for Youth with Chronic Conditions. I had the pleasure of participating with him in a work group during our studies in the University of New Hampshire Leadership Program. Tim's gonna uh, speak with us now. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Krista, thank you. Um, and uh, thank you uh, for the rare, to the rare disease uh, advisory council for letting me speak today. Um, uh, I wanna stick with kind of the, the theme that Nord, uh, they went over at the beginning of um, how vitally important uh, these organizations are, uh, like the Rare Disease Advisory Council, Council Use with Chronic Conditions, and Nord to, to bring people together. That's the most important thing to, to network. And, and I'm gonna kind of go over um, a little bit of a success story um, uh, with uh, CF to kind of uh, emphasize that. Now, um, this is my son, Reed. On the left is a picture of uh, one of our walks. We, we participate in something called Great Strides. It's one of the main ways we raise money uh, to help find a cure. Uh, the other picture is him next to the Lamborghini that he thinks he's gonna get when he turns 16, but um, we'll have that discussion later. Um, so I wanna go over um, uh, our, our experience and what my son goes through on a uh, daily basis. And it's been my, uh, through the years, it seems like most people have heard of CF. Very few people understand exactly what it is. So I'm gonna go through my 30 seconds of science if you bear with me, because I think it's important. Um, so CF is a genetic disease um, and the mutated gene is responsible for producing something called the CFTR protein. Now that protein controls uh, the chloride channel in the body. And what the chloride channel does is it allows water to pass to the surface of, and it pass through the uh, cell wall to the surface of the cell. So in CF, that CFTR protein does not work and neither does the chloride channel. So there's no water going to the surface of the cell. What happens is the mucus in the body becomes thick and sticky. And um, you probably didn't think you were gonna spend the afternoon talking about mucus, but I'm gonna take you there. Um, and so, uh, the problem is uh, mucus is in several vital organs in the body and it needs that mucus to uh, perform correctly for, for kids to stay healthy and adults actually. And so what happens is, um, uh, we'll, we'll go over a couple of the vital organs, uh, the two main ones being the pancreas. And when the pancreas doesn't work, uh, enzymes needed to digest food aren't produced. Um, my son has to take uh, many, many pills uh, a day just to, to process the food. Um, a lot of kids with CF have a failure to thrive uh, and that uh, kind of cripples their ability to, um, to fight the disease. Another big one is the lungs. And that's, that's the, the, the one that, that we, uh, we struggle with uh, the most. Um, if the mucus is thick and sticky, the cilia in your lungs can't pull out the things that that are, I mean, there are many things that are hazardous to kids with CF that wouldn't affect you or I. Um, and so the, what, what we need to do every day is do for Reed's body what he cannot do for himself. And that involves, like I said, uh, a lot of medications to, uh, to mimic the function of the pancreas. And also we have to uh, uh, introduce um, uh, physical therapy, he wears a vest twice a day, half an hour in the morning, 45 minutes at night. That's when he's healthy. When he's not healthy, it's more uh, just to loosen up that mucus and bring it out. Um, and so uh, that has been basically the way we've treated uh, CF up until about 10 years ago. And I'll tell you a, a, a big story is back in the 70s, um, a bunch of people got together because CF was really not known. They didn't understand the process of, uh, they, they had these kids that were sick, but they didn't understand what was happening. They started to identify a few things. They got together, uh, a bunch of parents got together and said, you know, nobody's paying attention to this. Uh, it happened that a lot of these people were very smart, successful, and well-connected. So they, they networked. Uh, they created something called the CF Foundation. 
And through the foundation, they were able to do like a, a lot of amazing things. When my son was born 10 years ago, his life expectancy was 29. Uh, now it's in the, the mid forties and rising um, every day. So uh, the way that they've kind of tackled this is um, they, a big thing they did was they develop uh, specialized care centers um, throughout the country. There's a hundred or so of these. And so my son goes to Dartmouth, uh, the CF clinic there uh, three, four times a year, um, more when he's, when he's sick. And then they, uh, he goes through a, a assembly line of about eight doctors. They check out everything for him. But if I took my son to, and I'm sure a lot of people have this, uh, this issue, took, took him to his, um, you know, primary care physician, they wouldn't know what to do with him. Uh, so we're very lucky that we have these clinics. And one of the neat things that they do is that they'll share information throughout the country uh, from all of these clinics. Uh, say like you have a, a clinic in Washington that, you know, their lung function, their average is in, in the 90s. And say somebody from Florida, you know, that clinic, their lung function is in the 70s. Why? Um, what, what's the reason? And, and through that, they've been able to share uh, a lot of the, the successes and pass them on from, from person to person. And another big thing that the CF Foundation has done is they kind of created uh, something called venture philanthropy, where uh, they couldn't get uh, anybody to uh, any of the drug companies to pay attention to them because there are so, so few people with CF. So they said, well, we're going to take it in our, our own hands. Um, and so, uh, you know, they've um, uh, partnered with a, a lot of drug companies and, and the biggest one and the most exciting thing that's happening now is uh, Vertex Pharmaceuticals has come out with a drug. Uh, we can't take it yet. It, it's for, uh, approved for 12 and over. So when he turns 12 in July, we're going to get him on it. But for the first time, they have a drug that treats the underlying cause of the disease. It cor corrects that CFTR protein, makes it work like it's supposed to water gets to the surface, the mucus is, is, uh, is thinner, and it's amazing what it's done. It's a miracle. Um, people have come off of lung transplant lists right and left. Uh, you know, they, they're putting on weight, their, their lung function is improving. So, you know, and like I said, it's all from people coming together and communicating. And, and you know, my experience with the, the chronic, uh, the council with, with, yeah, for youth with chronic conditions is, so many great minds, uh, so many uh, motivated people. There's no people more motivated than, you know, uh, people that, that are, are living through these experiences and just to be able to communicate. And um, uh, it, it just seems like there, there's really no bounds. I mean, this, this is why I'd like to, to share this story because it is a success, it can happen. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, there'll be more stories like this because I know a lot of diseases are kind of adapting uh, this model and um, uh, we're hoping for good things from everybody. Are there any questions uh, or comments, uh, feel free to, to chime in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. We actually, we're gonna um, save questions until all of the panelists have, have shared. Thank you very much. Sounds good. Appreciate. Okay. So Reagan Lanfier uh, lives in Nashua. She's a mom working for a more just and equitable future for the people of New Hampshire, particularly those with a disability. She's a member of the Council for Youth with Chronic Conditions uh, and the Family Support Council of Gateways. She's also a proud graduate of the University of New Hampshire Institute on Disability Leadership Program. Uh, Reagan is going to speak next. Hi, everybody. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about my experience of um, being a parent of a child with a chronic condition. <clears throat> so when a rare disorder enters your life, it changes everything. I learned quickly that any certainty I once had about the future was gone forever. On any day, a medical crisis or even a routine illness could shake the foundations of my world. Uh, before my son Ethan was born, I thought that disability was something that only happened to other people. However, no one is safe from chronic illness or a rare disorder. These things can touch any of us without warning. Ethan's entire life was a wild roller coaster of fear and joy, constant exhaustion, unbelievable stress, and so much love. It would take an awfully long time to tell you all about his medical issues, so I'm gonna keep it short. Uh, when he was an infant, Ethan had a seizure, 
and doctors told us he had a serious brain injury. We never found out how or why this happened. And even worse, no doctor could tell us what his future would hold. Even when we eventually received a diagnosis of a rare disorder, we were informed that it was unrelated to his original brain injury. Um, so still no answers. And it's hard, it's hard to live without those answers. So I just try not to think about it too much. During his first year, Ethan had seizures, a mini stroke and infantile spasms, which are a rare and destructive type of seizure. Things calmed down for a while after that, and we became used to the daily routines of caring for a toddler with serious medical issues. Uh, life was not easy, but it was pretty good. Then a few months before his fourth birthday, Ethan had a major stroke. That's when we found out he had Moya Moya, a disease that breaks down the blood vessels of the brain and causes multiple strokes if left untreated. Ethan lost the use of his left arm and developed type 1 diabetes due to the trauma of his stroke. But in the next year or so, he made it through two brain surgeries with no complications. This relatively new procedure is the only treatment for Moya Moya outside of baby aspirin. Uh, the surgeries redirected blood from Ethan's temples and scalp so that the blood flow to his brain would not be dependent on the vessel that Moya Moya was damaging. After the stroke, everything was more hectic than ever. Life just never slowed down enough for us to catch our breath. Um, so loneliness was a big part of my experience parenting a child who was medically fragile. I felt that friends, coworkers, and even extended family couldn't relate to my day-to-day -day life or the unexpected happiness that was part of being Ethan's mom. I wonder now how much of that isolation was real and how much of it was self-inflicted by my own implicit bias. In the beginning, I was in complete denial about the severity of Ethan's condition. As time passed, however, I accepted that his medical issues and developmental disabilities were part of what made him the boy I loved. I am tremendously proud of Ethan. He fought so hard for everything he accomplished. There were a few times a stranger stopped me when we were in the store and said, God bless you to me. Uh, I never knew what to say, and it always left me shaken and angry. I didn't need their prayers. My life did not look the way I had planned. Our whole family revolved around Ethan's medicine schedule, his diabetes, his therapies, doctor's appointments, and occasional hospital stays. I was plagued with guilt that I wasn't doing enough for Ethan or for his big brother, Thomas, who knew Ethan's needs always had to come before his normal teenage issues. I worried about the future constantly because I was always stretched to the limit. I was anxious about money and my relationship and always, always about what would happen to Ethan when I died. None of this meant I regretted or resented being Ethan's mother, um, not at all. I felt uh, like the luckiest person in the world. I got to have this, um, this ball of fire, this stubborn, funny, and determined little boy in my life. Even on the very bad days, I loved him unconditionally. I love him the way you love your children. Um. So um, Ethan passed away suddenly when he had just turned eight. Um, after all he had been through, it wasn't his very disorder that took him. He died from a cold that turned to pneumonia. It's been a long time now, more than six years, and we have grown accustomed to living with his absence, but we miss him so very much. I, I try to honor Ethan by sharing what I learned from him. My first and most important lesson is that no rare disorder or disability can diminish the worth of a human being. We all deserve to be respected and valued. It is beyond tragic that so many Americans do not understand this simple fact, which is why a robust advocacy network is so incredibly important for our community. Activists who came before us worked tirelessly to create and improve the systems and support that gave Ethan a good life. They fought insurance companies and the medical establishment for access to more effective medication and innovative treatments. Then they, uh, they educated our elected officials about what their families needed to be successful. Then they pressured those officials to pass laws that protect the civil rights of people with disabilities and chronic conditions. I am eternally grateful for their work. I don't know what Ethan's life would have looked like without, without what they did. Um, there's still unfortunately a long way to go. Uh, the stigma against those who experience rare disorders remains strong and an unacceptable percentage of this population live in poverty. So the work must continue. 
the barriers are not insurmountable. The Rare Action Network and the National Organization for Rare Disorders are educating families, the medical field, and the general public about what it means to live with a chronic condition. This is how we bring about change. When we all work together, we can ensure that every rare person has a chance of a better, happier, and healthier future. Thank you uh, very much, Regan. I really appreciate uh, what you had to say. Thank you. It was an honor to be asked. Thank you. Uh, Kim Pang is gonna uh, speak next. Uh, Kim has done volunteer work to improve education and awareness of rare disorders locally. Uh, Kim was the first New Hampshire State Ambassador for the RAN uh, Network. Uh, she's a founding member of the New Hampshire Rare Disorders Association. Kim lives with her husband, two cats, a dog, and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Currently, she's working on a Pilates instructor program, which she hopes will help other people living with chronic conditions as much as it's helped her. Kim? Thanks, Krista. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, Krista asked me to speak, and I just wrote down sort of a collection of thoughts, experiences, and feelings about living with a rare disorder. Um, so here it is. Uh, at 29, I had sudden, inexplicable, and severe loss of mobility, followed by pain and loss of function in my upper extremities. I ended up with chronic pain from my neck to my feet. It was hard to move. There was overwhelming fatigue. I saw specialists, psychiatrists, counselors, had tests, tried alternative treatments. I kept getting worse. Do you have the time and financial resources to keep pursuing a diagnosis? It really is a full-time job. A lack of diagnosis meant getting inappropriate treatments while continuing to get worse. I would cry at the end of each workday because I didn't know how I would make it through the next day. With a diagnosis and inappropriate hip surgery and the resulting deconditioning that made me worse could have been avoided. I was supposed to be all recovered and back to work in six weeks. Six months passed. I was worse, my savings ran out. I had to ask my, my new husband to pay my student loan bills, medical bills, and car payments. I locked out, he could afford it. The loss of independence was devastating. I became majorly depressed. Four years in, I became suicidal. I spent six weeks at New Hampshire Hospital trialing psychiatric meds and getting electroconvulsive treatments. I asked to continue physical therapy while I was there. I was told a PT would see me. It never happened. My physical needs were not being met and no one was trying to figure out the root of the problem. Physical and psychiatric needs must be addressed concurrently, but that's not how our health system works. I was discharged feeling no better than I, than I did when I arrived. I still wanted to die. I called yet another specialist when I got home. I lucked out, he knew what was wrong. I was lucky it only took five years. There was no cure. The best option was physical therapy, a very specific type. Again, I lucked out. There were two therapists in Rhode Island who specialized in treating my condition. I lucked out at home too. I met a therapist who was willing to take the time to learn about the best way to treat my condition. She was patient, didn't get overwhelmed by my complicated issues, and was good at putting the pieces of the puzzle together. I worked with her for nearly three years, twice a week. I made progress. My mobility improved, the pain decreased. Between the high deductible insurance plan through my husband's employer and running out of PT visits by the time the deductible was met, we paid approximately $4,000 a year out of pocket. Basically, the insurance didn't cover any of it. I was lucky I had someone to pay the bills so I could keep my health and rehab a priority. So what's the theme here? I'd say it's luck. Why do we have to be lucky to get a diagnosis? Why do we have to be lucky to have the financial resources and time to pursue a diagnosis for years? Why do we have to be lucky to have insurance that covers what we need? There are national issues such as providers not having the time to get a thorough health history, to have a good initial foundation to work from. There are preconceived notions taught in medical school that you will never see a rare disorder in your career. If you're not looking for it, you'll never find it. These larger issues are hard to address. They must be changed with education and probably federal legislation. 
but what can be done through state legislation? Uh, we can address the cost of prescriptions, address high deductible health plans, have better coverage for therapies. In my case, physical therapy is my medication. For people with rare disorders that have no cure or definitive treatment, that's most of them by the way, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy may be the only treatments available to them. High deductible, health insur uh, high deductible insurance plans and plans that only cover a limited number of visits per year prevent the use of these very effective and quality of life treatments. Physical therapy is my medication. To continue to regain function, I need manual therapy with constant adjustments to my program. It's paid entirely out of pocket and we have a good health insurance plan. Uh, I'm grateful that the Rare Disease Advisory Council is monitoring legislation that can impact the rare community in New Hampshire. I'm grateful to NORD and, and New Hampshire RAND too, and, and everything all of you are doing, just talking about your experiences. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, I, before we move on, I just would like to thank all, um, all three of our speakers just for the amount of bravery that you've shown in terms of just being able to be so honest um, and vulnerable with your experiences. So thank you very much. Um, we're next going to hear from Dr. Lisa Plotnick. Um, she is a dual board certified uh, physician in internal medicine and pediatrics. Uh, she is leading the new complex primary care clinic at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Manchester as they provide primary care to patients with medical complexity and include the entire family and caregiver team in the practice. The clinic sees many patients with rare illnesses, including inborn errors of metabolism, cystic fibrosis, complex congenital heart disease, autism, spastic quadriplegia, and other diagnosis. Dr. Plotnick. Hello. Um, I originally was going to be interviewing with Angela, and I don't know if Angela, the plan is still the same. We were going to do a little mini interview for this session. Am, yep. Am I, am I unmuted, Krista? You are. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Plotnick. I am delighted to have you joining us today. Um, and were you able to uh, hear these wonderful stories from our patients and caregivers? Uh, yes, they're very, very um, emotional and tug at the heartstrings and really represent all of the what's good in our family system and what's sometimes more challenging about our healthcare system. Now, would you say that uh, some of the stories that you, you heard today, is this consistent with things that you see in your patient population? Definitely. I, I think the majority of our families that we take care of live similar challenges, um, living full vital lives for, with their children or themselves with complex medical illness, but um, lives very different than what other people think of as normal. Right. Now, uh, Dr. Plotnick, we had um, talked in the past about this um, as, as the, I'm the president of the New Hampshire Rare Disorders Association. And so you and I have um, a shared interest in making sure that the patients in our state have their, their complex wraparound needs addressed. Um, and some of the things that we've talked about in the past have been um, how difficult it is for patients with rare and complex conditions to be able to access the care they need. What are some of the things that um, you think are barriers in, in our state? Well, just listening to the three speakers ahead of us, they've outlined many of the barriers to healthcare with a complex illness. The, I think they're barriers for all healthcare let alone if you have something that's difficult to diagnose or difficult to get under control. So finding a provider who listens, who can take the time to hear your story and not feel rushed. Unfortunately, healthcare has become very fast paced, um, rapid moving, moving somebody into the room and out. So you lose that ability to 
really hear the patient because if you listen hard enough, often the patient will tell you what's going on um, and help you make that diagnosis. And if you can't take the time, so time is valuable and often missing. Um, the willingness to learn sometimes isn't always there because I think many health professionals also deem themselves the expert, even if they don't know the answers. If they don't know it, it must not be. I don't know, I feel like some people feel it, that if they don't know it, it doesn't exist. Um, so being willing to learn, doing some research, um, consulting peers, mm. you know, talking, not, not functioning in isolation um, to find answers. Um, insurance poses a challenge with various restrictions and high deductibles and limitations on where you can go and who you can see. Um, Kim's story demonstrated why physical therapy is so vital for life, not just to restore, but to sustain. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time arguing with insurance companies to continue PT for someone who may never regain the skills they've lost, but without PT, they will continue to lose the skills they've regained. Right. And trying to change the definition of what the purpose of PT is, is really important with any of the therapies, whether it's occupational speech or physical therapy, it, they're not just to help you recover, but they are often to maintain your level of functioning. Right. And that's lost in a lot of administrators. So I think you've um, mentioned then something that as advocates, we can be focusing on some ways to help um, ensure that the insurance industries are supporting both our patients and our providers to be able to have the time that they need to get a diagnosis, develop a treatment plan. Um, but I think um, in addition to that kind of advocacy work with um, ensuring adequacy from our insurance providers, you also mentioned um, the educational needs um, within the medical community. I like that you're bringing in kind of this, this kind of double whammy approach we can bring in. We can go in it with both barrels. What are some things that you would like to see us in New Hampshire doing to move things forward? Um, well, I think, you know, we have the luxury of being a small state where you think that people could talk and communicate and share ideas in a very efficient manner, but I think still people are siloed in their practices. They may mm. not even know who else is in their building in a multi-specialty group, let mm. alone who else is around the state and who does, who, who is an expert in something that you might need and how do you connect with them. Um, I think people are hesitant to pick up the phone or email or, um, you know, reach out and talk to those people. Um, I, I, I don't know if it's a fear of looking weak um, or why people aren't reaching out and, and trying to partner with other people. Um, mm. But I think we have the luxury of smallness. Um, mm. And in theory, that should make us a lot more connected. And I don't think we are as connected as we could be as practitioners. So I don't know how to make people more connected, like what sort of resource would be the best to tell people who does what out there. Um, but I think just the willingness to look needs to be more accepted. And it does not mean you're a poor provider. It means you're curious right. and want to build that team. Right. And that's one of the things that um, we have discussed in the past, the idea that patients don't expect us to be um, all knowing. They expect us to be open and willing to learn and willing to keep fighting for them to get their health care. I think you're a beautiful example of, of that. And I, I think we do have a lot of that in New Hampshire. Agreed. I, I, and I think we, you know, if we can continue to build the camaraderie and partnership through the medical society, through the nursing programs and nurse practitioners and PAs, there's healthcare being provided by a lot of different types of experts. Um, you know, being willing to hear a physical therapist tell you what they think is going on or mm -hmm. an occupational therapist, just because they don't have the same degree 
they have a completely different set of training that may fill in a, like, a gap in your training. Right. Uh, there's so many different ways to learn from others, as well That's as the right. family. You yeah, know, they're absolutely. the expert in their, in their patients. Absolutely. That's one of the things that I think um, we haven't necessarily fully explored the value of our, um, our Rare Disease Advisory Council is both for the legislative educational value and to be changing um, laws, but also for the kind of the collaborative, the convening um, body that it is. Um, and I'm really excited to um, see how we can further develop this, you know, in the coming years. That'd be great. Um, we had talked about some other needs also that I think we want to make sure that we bring to the <sighs> council. Um, we, met, we talked a bit about things like um, uh, direct, uh, direct service providers, uh, making sure that we have uh, adequate um, education, <laughs> reimbursement. And we also talked a bit about things like uh, medical nutrition, uh, medical foods. Can you um, kind of summarize some of the discussions we've I think my puppy is trying to do it for me. Um, <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, I would normally be able to try to, to um, entertain her, but I'm at home with a back injury, so I'm not very mobile. Um, so um, I think one of the biggest arg arguments I have, Sasha, I'm not winning the battle here. Um, <laughs> um, medical foods touches on a lot of Sasha, please don't look at me like that. I feel like I have a child. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so how, how about I'll, I'll, um, I'll tell a little bit about what I, I can recall of our conversation and then um, you can you can chime in and let me know if I've, I've adequately um, uh, expressed um, your, your thoughts. Um, one of the things that patients with rare disorders or complex medical conditions, um, they'll often have um, needs for uh, unique either supplementation, um, sometimes entirely need to support themselves through um, formulas or other um, nutritional uh, replacements. There have been uh, wonderful reforms in baby formulas, for example, but we've not had that same level of um, quality um, review and requirements put onto some of our, um, our other uh, nutritional formula replacements. And that one of the things that you had indicated is that you would love for us to uh, make sure that the quality of the nutritional replacement is there for all um, medical food uh, provisions, all formulas and, re and replacements to make sure that our adults, as well as our babies, um, are able to get the um, a good quality nutrition. Sure. I, I think, you know, having access to clean, um, well-manufactured formulas um, is essential for many of our patients um, who require supplementation. The rule that someone can't get their nutrition covered unless it's covering you know, nearly 100% of the caloric needs is mm -hmm. pretty lame I, in my mind because some people just can't digest or chew and swallow enough food by mouth due to right. fatigue or other health conditions. And then they're limited on their ability to access supplemental nutrition. Um, so really, it's very short-sighted in my mind to only pay for it if you only if you need 100% nutrition um, mm -hmm. rather than you know maybe half your food um, or you have an illness that flares and sometimes you can eat and sometimes you can't. How do you wait the 30 days it seems to take to get your nutrition? You're you know dead or better. You know that's not a good plan. Um, yeah. You know to have to wait that long. Uh, that, that's just not acceptable. And we also, as part of that, you'd also mentioned um, making sure that the amount of foods that you need, um, because there's limitations, restrictions on how much a person is able to have covered, um, and that being able to adequately care for yourself 
is one of the most basic human rights and we, we want to continue to lobby to make sure that people have those uh, rights um, preserved. Right, I mean, we, we have supplemental um, nutrition using food stamps, but food stamps doesn't cover things that, you know, when people need tube feedings. Um, mm. And so we offer it to the general population based on their financial status, not necessarily about their illness status. Um, but if you have an illness, then you're kind of in a, another hard place to be able yes. to get your nutrition covered. Um, and I think we're getting um, close to um, our time limit, but I know that you, um, at one point, we're going to be able to stay for questions afterwards. Sure. If in the Q&A sessions, if we have a, a chance, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of this, um, the poverty-based um, uh, kind of a stigma and restrictions that are on um, the rare disease community. But um, for now, we can turn it back over to um, Krista. And then if they'll indulge us to um, follow up on a little bit more of some of the issues that we discussed previously, I think um, it'd be very useful to the group. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, next, we're going to hear from Senator uh, Cindy Rosenwald, uh, who represents Nashua. Um, she's serving in her second term in the New Hampshire Senate after seven terms in the House of Representatives. She is the Deputy Democratic Leader, a position she also held in the House. She sits on the Finance and Ways and Means Committee. She was previously Chair of the House Health and Human Services and Elderly Affairs Committee. She's, a Nash she's been a Nashua resident for 32 years. She has a bachelor's degree from Harvard and a master's degree from Riviera. She and her husband, Peter, have two adult children. Senator Rosenwald was a co-sponsor of House Bill 237 in 2019, which established the Rare Disease Advisory Council. She was appointed by Governor Sununu to serve on the RDAC as a representative of the Senate and has done so since its first meeting in September, 2019. Senator Rosenwald. Great, thank you. It's great to be with you all and I'd really like to thank my fellow speakers for telling their personal stories. Um, your stories really, really matter to lawmakers. They're very helpful to us as we look sometimes at what looks like just cold legislative language. Um, so over my 16 years in the House and the Senate, I have focused on health policy and health program funding. And as Krista said, I'm currently serving on finance and ways and means. So that's both raising money and spending it to benefit the residents of New Hampshire. This year, I have a number of bills to increase access to health and human services programs in New Hampshire one of which is to get dental care for adults on Medicaid. And another one, um, as I was listening to Kim, particularly is to uh, clarify that, and it's only for Medicaid, but to clarify specifically that mental health care counts as health care. And whatever requirements you have for what you spend, what you've spent on mental health care, counts towards that. So I think I'm unique on the council in that I'm neither a healthcare professional and nor do I have a personal connection to a rare disease. So while I've learned an incredible amount from the many people uh, on the council with me, specifically how many people are affected by rare diseases and what these diseases are, I'm also able to approach the topic without preconceptions and from a purely legislative point of view. So the questions that I consider when we meet are, what are the policy goals that our healthcare experts and the advocates have? What could be done to achieve these goals without enacting a law? If, um, if there is a need for a law, what might it cost and how could we fund it? What's the role of state government to achieve these goals? 
And what's the timing for the action that's recommended to the legislature? Um, we've also been reporting, um, following and reporting on other bills that might be of interest to the rare disease community, even if it's not directly related. And um, I, I just would say that it's really been a privilege for me to serve on this committee and I hope to be able to continue to do so through the current term. Thanks, I'll stop there, Krista. Thank you, Senator Rosenwald, uh, for sharing. Um, um, and thank you, everyone, for, for sharing your story, Senator Rosenwald. Thank you, Dr. Plotnick, um, as well as uh, the other speakers to share their stories. I'm really very touched. Um, we do have a little spot of um, if you have any questions. Um, if you um, don't have any questions right now, we do have um, a little bit of time at the very end of the event, and we're happy to um, answer any questions or listen to any concerns and whatnot. Um, I'm Heather Daniak, and I'm the other NORD uh, New Hampshire ambassador with Krista. Um, my story is that a few years ago, I decided I'd like to meet others in New Hampshire who also have had a journey with rare diseases or rare disorders. I met a few of the board members um, from the New Hampshire Rare Disorder Association and immediately felt at home chatting with them. My story begins with rare about 12 years ago when my son Nicholas was diagnosed at the age of five with a rare fatal neurodegenerative brain disease called Batten disease. Um, this is a lysosomal storage disease that affects two to four in 100,000 children born in the United States. Batten disease causes seizures, blindness, dementia, immobility, and eventually requires 24 hour care. The cruel part of this disease is that the children are vibrant and healthy until it takes until it takes course around the age of four. Eventually, Batten disease takes over their brain and the children die between eight and 12. My son Nicholas passed away on his 11th birthday about six years ago. I miss him every day and there still is no cure for this rare childhood brain disease. What helped me survive through these dark days with Nicholas was my continuous contact with my with with families here in New Hampshire as around also around the world who have children or cared for loved ones with, with dif disabilities or a rare disease or disorder. I have to say that I've made much better quality friends in this group than in my past life. So I'm here and my desire is to help to bring families together as much as I'm able. And so our next slide So I just wanted to share, um, again, uh, the, the NORD website. So we're not going to go into the website, <clears throat> but it's raredisease.org. <clears throat> if you have any questions, um, we also, sorry, we also have <clears throat> the New Hampshire Rare Action Network website, which is rarenewhampshire.org. <clears throat> um, um, so if you're, you're interested in joining us, we're always looking for volunteers um, and we always are looking for people to share their stories. Um, please contact us. The next screen or the next slide is our contact information. <clears throat> so, um, mine is Heather Daniak at rareaction.org uh, and Krista's uh, email is there as well, krista.gilbert at rareaction.org. Um, so ne next slide. Um, so this is my foundation, um, and I'll just briefly talk about it so that we can talk at the end and have some questions. Um, this is my foundation. Uh, we're a nonprofit uh, charity that my family started in 2009, which was soon after my son was diagnosed with his rare disease. Um, we have We've been fundraising for about 12 years and the money we raise goes towards science, research, nursing care, and family support for families that have uh, children with Batten disease. We've hosted about five scientific conferences to bring these elite brain scientists together to collaborate on a way to cure this disease. Uh, we've hosted over 100 fundraisers in the past years, <clears throat> but now we focus on one local event in Bedford called our Easter egg hunt. 
Um, we've had to cancel this event in the past two, this year as well, past two years because of the pandemic. Um, and this year we're hosting a Bunny and Friends Parade event, uh, parade, parade through event on March 28th at the New Hampshire Sportsplex in Bedford, New Hampshire. And families and children uh, will be able to safely drive by the Easter Bunny and Friends on this day. The event is free, but we're asking folks to register for the event. Um, uh, and so we will know how many goodie bags to give, give out to the kids. We've been supporting, uh, we've been, been supported by so many people in our community and local businesses. And this is just one of the ways we'd like to give back. Um, and for more details, you can visit our website. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit about our foundation and my experience with RARE. Uh, next, next slide. I'd like to um, introduce, um, I'd, like to, I'd like for you all to meet um, Suzanne Candela. She's a representative from an amazing organization in New England called PALS. Uh, she contacted me a few weeks ago to share about her organization and I wanted to bring her here to make sure you're all aware of the amazing services that she can offer our community. Oh, welcome, Suzanne. Hi, Heather. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm so happy to be here and um, and meet all of you guys. And uh, thank you to everyone who spoke. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, just after hearing your stories, um, I, you know, I think that this will be a really great resource for the rare disease community. And um, I'm actually signed up to present on several different state um, rare disease days this week. I had my first one yesterday and I actually recon <laughs> I, uh, recognize some faces from yesterday. So um, I am not sure if, you know, uh, who here knows about PALS, if you've heard about anything, um, you know, that we do, uh, but I'm really excited to introduce you guys to our organization and I hope that it can be of help to the community. Um, so I'm just going off my other presentation notes. Um, so what we are is a volunteer pilot organization. We're a nonprofit and we were found in 2010. Uh, so we've been, um, you know, helping out families for over 10 years now. And we are, uh, a volunteer pilot organization is um, an organization that utilizes volunteer pilots. And these are just everyday people who own their own aircrafts. They pay for their own fuel. Um, you know, so it's completely free of charge for the patients and they, you know, they love flying. It's their passion and they, they want to do it with purpose. So they sign up to be a volunteer, um, to help patients get to and from their, uh, medical appointments. If it's over a two hour car ride away, which I know for, um, with the rare disease community, sometimes a specialist for your disorder or your illness is not always local. Um, so that's where we come in. Um, we also have, uh, you know, these are private flights. They're very small, general aviation aircrafts, about four to six seaters. And we also have um, commercial partnerships with uh, Southwest Airlines. Um, they donate a certain amount of vouchers to us um, every year. It was a, a little bit short because of the airlines. Um, they took such a hit because of COVID. Um, but they um, donate a certain amount of vouchers to us every year that al that allows us to go uh, further. So if, if somebody needs to go cross country, we can um, give them vouchers. And, uh, you know, those, um, those do have some limitations, but patients can fly on a volunteer pilot um, flight as many times as they need, and we can support you throughout your whole journey. Um, we have some patients who need to go to clinical trials for, uh, for different cancer treatments and whatnot. And, um, some of them have to fly every single week and we're able to support them throughout that, um, you know, we can find them there and back flights, uh, you know, each week, which is really great. Um, let's see. Uh, like I said, we just celebrated our 10th anniversary in November. And um, when we started out, we only flew in the Northeast region. Um, most of our pilots were from New York, uh, the Boston area, um, but I'm proud to say that we have been successfully expanding into states more south and west. So now our volunteer pilots um, span from basically from Maine to Florida and then from um, you know the East Coast all the way out to Wisconsin. We just completed a, uh, a flight our first flight to Wisconsin, actually, uh, from Virginia. So that was um, that was kind of a big a big deal for us. Um, and we've acquired over 800 volunteer pilots uh, since inception. Um, 
Let's see. So uh, since we've expanded, uh, you know, to all of these new states, we're able to help that many more people and just go further. Um, so far, we have flown over 2,900 families and um, have provided over 23,000 free flights. Uh, we have altogether flown over 5,400,000 miles. And um, I can't share my screen, but <laughs> on, my, on my PowerPoint that I have been using, um, I have a picture of a little girl who we started flying um, from Northern Maine to her cancer treatment in Boston at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, she has flown on 59 PALS flights. Um, I believe she started flying when she was seven years old when she was first diagnosed, and we've been able to support her um, you know, for her entire cancer journey. It's still ongoing, uh, but she just recently turned 17. She's a senior in high school. And, um, you know, up in Northern Maine, it's very rural. There's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of great treatment for um, a lot of different cancers up there. So, um, you know, most of them have to drive 10, 12 hours to Boston. Uh, but when she comes to us, she only has to you know, do an hour and a half PALS flight, um, which takes her right to and from her treatment. And uh, and like I said, we've been able to help her with 59 flights so far. And um, lastly, I've listed my contact information. Um, our intake process and qualifications are uh, typically, you know, there has to be some financial need um, because the pilots are volunteering their, their money and their time. Um, but also, you know, if... Um, if you can't fly commercially because you're immune compromised or whatnot, or it's just too stressful, we ask that you do reach out anyway. We evaluate every request um, individually. We really do try to help as many people as we need, as um, as needed, and. Um, we, uh, you know, like other organizations, we do not require a copy of your W-2. Um, it's a very straightforward intake process. And, um, you know, you can go on our website, palservices.org to fill it out, or you can even reach out to me directly and we can do an intake over the phone. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty simple process. Um, our patients do have to be somewhat ambulatory to board these small aircrafts. Um, but we do have one stretcher plane that operates east of the Mississippi anywhere. Um, and it's, just one plane, there's about five pilots that are certified to fly it. Um, so that has worked out. We actually flew an ALS patient from Burlington, Vermont to Islip recently. And, um, you know, he was not ambulatory or whatnot and worked out great for him. Um, so that's another resource we have uh, for patients who aren't as ambulatory. Um, and there is no medical attention on board the aircrafts. Um, so, you know, we're, we're not an air ambulance service, but uh, for anyone um, who doesn't need uh, medical attention on flight, um, definitely re reach out to me. Uh, we've, you know, we've eliminated so many barriers for people that have to travel to and from medical treatment. And, um, and I would love to, you know, answer any questions that anyone has. Um, that's really about it to sum everything up. Uh, I know that, you know, there might be other speakers and I know we want to get to questions and whatnot. Um, so feel free to write down my contact information and reach out to me, um, you know, with any anything you might have or any, um, you know, if you know anyone that uh, that might be in need, definitely refer them to me. That's great. Thank you so much, Susan. Yeah. For being Thank so, you so much for having me. For being so thorough in your uh description of PALS. I think that's a great organization. Um, I wanted to show you the New Hampshire Rare uh, Disorder Associations. Here's the logo and here's um, our website. Um, uh, New Hampshire Rare Disorders Association is a 501c3 nonprofit. <clears throat> I just wanted to make sure that you're aware that we are here in New Hampshire. Um, we're an organization working to ensure high quality medical care and a high quality of life in uh, for New uh, New Hampshire residents living with a rare disease. The New Hampshire Rare Disorders Association's goal is to offer services in medical <clears throat> education, legislative advocacy, and communication aware, um, I'm sorry, community awareness. Uh, last spring, we were going to host our second Hoof Beats 5K in Concord, but due to the pandemic, um, we had to change it to be a virtual event, which was really fun and very successful. Um, we hope that we are going to hopefully be able to host a third event this year um, in the spring. Not sure if it's going to be virtual or live, but um, we're, we're working out the logistics for that. Um, and then our, our next slide. 
Um, this is the slide for the NORD um, swag. After the event, we'll be randomly selecting two winners from the attendee list to receive a, a rare disease day swag bags seen in this photo. The winners will be contacted by email this week and receive um, a prize mid-March. So good luck everyone, you might be a winner. <clears throat> and our next slide. So in closing, um, I just wanted to thank you for joining us. We do have a short Nord video showing about health, uh, health equality. Um, and then followed by, we, we are still live and we um, are happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Every year on the last day of February, the National Organization for Rare Disorders joins together with others around the world to raise awareness of the challenges faced by people living with rare diseases. Achieving health equity is even more difficult for rare patients. To have equity in health means everyone has an opportunity to be as healthy as possible, regardless of social, geographic, economic, or other obstacles that may be working against them. At NORD, we appreciate your support, which allows us to work on issues like health equity and many others, and for our staff and volunteers to bring them to the forefront on Rare Disease Day. From a volunteer state ambassadors, we would like to say thank you to all of our Rare Action Network supporters for helping us connect with rare patients and families in our states. And thank you for allowing the Rare Action Network to raise important issues with state lawmakers on Rare Disease Day and throughout the year. Did you know that in medical school, I was told when you hear hoofbeats, they think horses, not zebras. But what about the more than 25 million Americans living with a rare disease? At NORD, we are humbled to provide help and resources to our zebras and their caregivers. NORD support allowed me to catch up on some overdue bills, including my rent. Thank you for your support, NORD, and thank you for supporting Rare Disease Day. From all of us at NORD, thank you for your dedication to the rare disease community on Rare Disease Day and every day. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, I think uh, Dr. Shepard wanted to um, talk about a few things. You can just unmute your mic and talk away. Okay, All right. Um, can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Um, I noticed that one of the, um, the chat questions had put um, something forward um, geared towards Dr. Um, Plotnick. And I think that was one of the things that she and I had started discussing that how can we um, be building this opportunity for um, communication between providers? Um, and one of the things that the New Hampshire Rare Disorders Association is doing currently is um, conducting patient interviews. Um, we are videotaping them. And um, if on our Facebook page or on the website, you contact us, um, we're doing personalized videos with patients so that we can be using that to develop um, some targeted um, physician education um, and also using this education, uh, broadening it so that as Dr. Plotnick said, not just physicians, but also um, others within the healthcare community, um, dentists, physical therapists, um, mental health uh, folks, um, so that we can be having a more collaborative um, discussion um, that we can be trying to be more supportive of each other as a health provider community to be a better resource to our patient community. Um, so I wasn't sure if um, Dr. Plotnick had anything that she wanted to add to that about how we can be um, using this opportunity both as legislative advocates, but also as um, patient advocates within the, the medical provider community. Um, well, I was just reading one of some of the questions coming up in the chat and 
Pamela Becker asks about how to get people to communicate. Um, and is anyone, I think the thing that I would recommend having a discussion with the providers that you see or any of any patient seeing multiple providers is, is any one person besides yourself in charge of kind of the team? You know, who's helping you drive the bus to use another metaphor? Like, it can't be just you as the patient. There's supposed to be, there's supposed to be people on your side helping you. Um, and will it be your PCP or the specialist that's the expert in your illness that's mm -hmm. coordinating the communication? But, um, you know, I think hopefully someone when asked would step up and be that person coordinating um, and asking for, is there literature? Like, is there a summary about this illness that you're living with or that your loved one is living with to help the whole team understand how the, the disease process may affect various organ systems as well as the whole person? Um, so, you know, is there even just a one pager or is it, you know, lots of pages? Um, that might, you know, be an investment in time, but well worth it when it comes to caring for a patient with something that you may not see very often. Um, so hopefully someone can help quarterback this, um, mm -hmm. you know, that your care to be, um, you know, making you not have to do it alone. Um, if people right. say, if don't, if they define that role, then, you know, should they stay your PCP? Like, is it worth changing providers at some point if they're not going to be on your team helping you, you know, manage the flow of information. Uh, mm -hmm. I realize it's hard to just up and change PCPs, but, mm -hmm. you know, talking to friends and relatives like, hey, do you like your doctor? If, you, if you're not getting your needs met, mm -hmm. um, hopefully we have the capability to help you find another PCP that can help advocate. Um, they may not know it all or be able to do it all, but just having them on your side being willing mm -hmm. to do whatever they can is a start if, if you're being left to do it all yourself. Is there something that um, as, as advocates and as organizations that we can do to help make systemic changes to support um, great primary care providers like you? So that, um, I, I love the approach your clinic has. Is there ways that we could support um, a broader implementation of that kind of, um, that whole patient service for clinic development or for individual physicians, either way? Um, well, I think being involved in any patient and family advisory committees um, that may be part of the care team within an organization, um, I'm, where I work at Dartmouth. Dartmouth has a patient and family advisory council in each of their outpatient locations. So Nashua has one, Manchester has one, the main medical center up in Lebanon has one. And so, you know, I, I'm sure you're all tired of having to constantly advocate, advocate, advocate. But if you want to make, you know, sustainable changes, as a system that can also be a more bang for your buck, um, giving feedback of what works in their healthcare system and what doesn't, um, and will help you and your family members and people in the thick of providing healthcare don't always know where the problems are being able to get in to access the healthcare, especially mm -hmm. in a large organization where the workflows are done in many layers. You don't always mm -hmm. hear about how hard it was to get an appointment or actually get into the building or different things. So, um, you know, being able to voice that to people who are interested in learning, how can we make this better? Right, thank you. Yeah, that's great advice. And um, uh, Krista, I think uh, there are some other questions. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. All right, so um, we're, the next question we're gonna take is from Lynette Stebbins. I don't really have a question to um, proclamation. And, um, as well, here, 
Uh, yeah, through Rand, um, I put in for uh, the proclamation for the rare disease day. So I just wanted to show everybody that the governor signed it and um, it is cut in um, for the legislators. So, um, Are other to... people having some difficulty hearing Lynette or is it just on my computer? I am too. It might be a connection issue. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you guys hear me now? That well, is better. Uh, it's better, better yeah. Yes. <laughs> Lynette, can you can you restate what you said, please? I absolutely can. So I, I, I got new hearing aids this week. So I, I'm talking a lot softer than I was before. So I'm very sorry for that. Um, so um, as, uh, as a volunteer, uh, um, on behalf of, of RAN um, and part of the rare disease community, I um, put in a petition to have uh, February 28th is Rare Disease Day in the state of New Hampshire. Um, and this is the proclamation signed by the governor stating that February 28th is thank, thank you very much, Lynette. I think I think we're still having some difficulty. So so just for uh, clarification, I will restate what <laughs> Lynette said, and then uh, we'll move on. So uh, what Lynette said was. Um, Lynette, can you uh, mute your mic just because I'm, I'm getting a lot of feedback? And then I'll share with people what you, the work that you did. Lynette, um, Lynette worked on behalf of the Rare Action Network and the New Hampshire Rare Disorders Association uh, to get uh, a proclamation for Rare uh, Disease Day. Uh, for February 28th. So we uh, really appreciate the work that she did. So thank you very much, Lynette. Thank you, Lynette. Yeah. Are there other uh, questions either from the chat or um, anyone, uh, if you have a question, if you wanna raise your hand, uh, Heather will, uh, will recognize any questions that people have. I know we're getting close to the time. We have just a couple minutes left. I think I saw a hand raised by Jay. Khan, if you want to unmute your mic and you can ask, welcome. Uh, I just wanted to compliment Lynette on her uh, action with uh, de declaring February 28th the uh, Rare Disease Day. Thanks for the recognition. I hope uh, we have a chance to honor that through the week. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Does anybody have any other questions? Um, I don't know. I don't think I can see everybody if you're raising your hand. I believe that Anissa, Anissa is raising her hand. Okay. Oh, was I? I'm sorry. I didn't know that I was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, um, I had a question, if I could ask yes. it. Yes. Um, I think you muted. Regan, um, if you could, yep, yeah, there you go. Ask, start, start again and ask your question. Okay, I, I was just wondering, um, what, what would you, what would volunteers be doing if we volunteered with the Rare, with the, with the Rare Action Network or with the state, at the State Advocacy Network? Yeah, what are you guys working on now? That's a great question. I can hand it over to um, Chris and Heather if you guys want to give an overview and then I can jump in about as well. I'm going to let Chris to answer this one. <laughs> oh, I think you're muted, Krista. There, you there we go. Um, we are always looking for um, volunteers to 
attend the Rare Disease Advisory Council um, and uh, help to speak on behalf of Bill's um, to, to testify. Um, certainly any uh, events that we're having, we can always use help there. Um, if testifying is not uh, something that you're interested in, um, sending out emails, um, things like that. Any, any um, strengths that you have are certainly things that we can uh, capitalize on. Any and all volunteers, um, anything that you're interested in, we, we welcome. Um, and I'm certainly happy to, to talk with you offline if, if you're interested in that. Any, anyone that, that has any interest in volunteering, please contact us. Thank you for the question. I can see that we're right at 4.30, um, so we should probably wind things up. Um, we really appreciate everyone uh, joining us. Thank you very much. I um, feel like I uh, certainly learned a lot today and appreciate everyone sharing their experience. So I think, I think that that's probably, um, that's probably it. Heather, do you have anything that you would like to um, just, before we close, I just wanted to say thank you so much for everyone joining us today. It's a, I, I agree with Krista, just listening to your stories um, is very touching to my heart and really touches me deeply. Um, so hope, hopefully I can uh, meet you all in person soon uh, when we're done with the pandemic. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for joining us. And I do see there are a few questions in the chat. Um, and so Krista and I can go through the questions and um, reach back out to you and answer. Um, so that's it for now. Uh, hope you all have a good rest of the day and uh, Rare C Disease Day is actually on Sunday, um, February 28th. So um, we'll be promoting it all week long, of course, and um, hopefully we can, uh, we'll all stay connected. Thank you so much. Stay well. Thank you, that was wonderful. It's Debbie with the Amicus.